Bonjour. Welcome to Wasa Distance Education Center's radio Zoom classes. This is SVN3E, Grade 11 Workplace Science, and I'm Bronwyn Slade. Can't participate live today because this is a pre recorded lesson, uh, but you can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM or on the television at Bell Express View Channel 972. Our classes are scheduled Monday through Thursday from 3 till 4 in the afternoon. And we are in our eighth week of our nine week course. A reminder that June 10th is the last day to submit your work. So it is essential that you get your work in as soon as possible. There's also a culminating final project that you need to do once your work is submitted that you don't have yet. And so you still need to plan for that before June 10th as well. A reminder that the key questions are listed at the end of each of your IL lesson, so you can find them there. The questions are actually in your workbook, but the list of questions which are assigned are at the end of your IL lessons. So do all of them. Some of them are check your understanding questions, some of them are activities, and then the rest are review questions. So make sure that you're doing the correct ones. Show all of your work, your steps and your thinking. Make sure you are actually answering the question and not just talking on the topic. Write in complete sentences, give me complete ideas. You can do this by hand or electronically, both are fine for me. If you want to write in your workbook, you can, that is fine. Um, it's small space, so you might not have enough room, but if you think you do and you think I can still read it, then go for it. If you're going to hand it in electronically, using Word or Google Docs are the easiest files for me to open. If you need to use something else, that's probably fine. Just let me know so that we can figure it out together. All of our students have access to Google Docs through an NEC email account. Um, if you need help with that, let me know and I will walk you through it. There are three different methods for submitting your work. The first method is to send your work in electronically. So if you need to scan it, you can use the scan functions on a smart device, iPhone, the Notes app has a scan function and Android Google Drive has a scan function. If you need help to do that or you need someone to walk you through, let me know and I'm happy to support you to do that. Then you can send it through email to studentwork at nnec.on.ca or cc it, and sorry, ncc it to bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca. Or you can also send it to me through Facebook Messenger at bslatewasa. The second method is to drop your work off in Sue Lookout. We have an outdoor mailbox at our location 74 Front Street. We're the bright red building next to the post office and we have a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. Third method is to hand your work in through your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you'd like to connect with me through social media, feel free. Both my Facebook and my YouTube channel are under the name B Slade Wassa. So you can find me hopefully fairly easily. All of our classes are recorded and shared on YouTube, whether or not they're live. And I share them on Facebook as well. Everything can be found under a playlist on my YouTube channel that's called SVN3E. As well, all of our supplementary videos are there. Um, so you can find them from their original sources. Science is a really visual subject, so I highly encourage you to access the videos. I do as many pictures and images and videos uh, as I can um, to sort of give us a whole understanding of the experience. So just listening to it isn't gonna give you a full understanding of what's going on. Um, you can join me live on Zoom and just watch without talking to me, that's totally fine. Or you can watch the replays on YouTube. If neither of those work, then let me know and I can send you a copy of the recordings. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and contact me. This is why I'm here. Uh, I really want you to get your work in before June 10th. So reach out if you're struggling with anything and we need to make a plan, we can do that together. My email address is bronwyn.slate which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. 
You can find me again on Facebook at B Slate Wassa. You can call me at the office at 807-737-1488, extension 2209, or toll free at 1-800-667-3703. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So feel free to reach out to me during that time if you want to try to get a hold of me directly. I will get back to you uh, within those hours fairly quickly if I uh, need be. Uh, usually within 24 hours if I don't, if you email me outside of or you contact me outside of my work hours, then I generally will get back to you within the next day. Um, unless for some reason I'm not here or something has come up, but usually I get back to you fairly quickly. And I think it's really important to position myself as an educator, as I have certain privileges that were unearned or are unearned and have shaped me as an educator. Particularly, I have white settler ancestry, I have white privilege, and that impacts my experience of education dramatically. I fit within the system, the system is built for me, and therefore things come easily to me that they don't come easily to other folks. That's the system is set up for other people to not be successful. I recognize this and I work hard to disrupt these cycles within my classroom, within my courses, as I think it's important for everyone to have access to education and knowledge and for everyone to have access to more than one perspective opposed to just this, this one ideal, um, this one white ideal, which is problematic and not okay. Anyway, I live in Northwestern Ontario on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe people. And I am consistently working to learn from this culture around me and honor the knowledge keepers here. However, this isn't my first time teaching this course, so I do have lots to learn and unlearn. There are many things I'm realizing, mistakes that I'm making, or even technical issues that I'm having. Um, so there's lots of opportunity for me to grow as I continue to work to teach this course. Uh, if anyone has any feedback and would like to share that with me, feel free. I'm open to feedback and would like to improve. Also, our textbook I've found is incredibly Eurocentric, uh, really positioning the white experience uh, as the experience. I think this is problematic and I realize it ignores, consistently ignores Indigenous, Inuit, and Métis knowledges and experiences. Um, I work to integrate these into our lessons, but I am not always successful in doing so. So we are in unit seven, using natural resources with sustainable practices. Um, so you may have heard free, the right to free speech, probably we've talked about it, um, but, and therefore have heard the right to water. So this is continuing the idea that um, United Nations argues that we should have access to clean water as a human right. Yet over 1.1 billion people lack access to adequate, adequate water supply, including, I know, including people in Ontario, in our communities, people potentially taking this course do not have access to clean, adequate, accessible water. Earth's water is under threat from human-made pollution and large corporations that buy up water reserves for profit. So right to water activists argue that countries with abundant fresh water resources like Canada should share their water and not sell it. Also should make it accessible to everyone who lives here as well. All right, so we are in lesson 22. This is our second last lesson. This is methods for extracting Canada's natural resources. We've talked about what the natural resources are and now how do we extract them from the earth. So at the end of this lesson, you'll be able to describe common methods of resource extraction in Canada and you will understand the environmental issues of each of these methods. You'll be able to explain various methods of commercial fishing and their consequences. You'll be able to explain various methods of logging and their consequences. And you'll be able to explain the different methods of mining salt and their consequences. All right, so we've learned about Canada's different natural resources. For every type of natural resource, there are many ways to extract or remove it for human use. We will explore some extraction methods for commercial fisheries, forestry, and salt today. So let's dive in. Commercial fishery. 
So gill netting and hercining are the most common um, commercial fishing methods that target fish for direct human consumption and rely on different types of nets and lines. So these two examples, gill netting and hercining are what we're gonna look at. So here is one image of uh, gill nettings. Either you have drift ones which are being pulled along behind boats or set ones which are on the ground and will be returned to. And then we have purse seaming, which we'll look into in terms of you're on a boat and you are hauling a net. So gill netting are long flat nets that are hung vertically in any depth of water using a combination of wets, sorry, weights at the bottom and buoyant floats at the top. They become almost invisible fences that fish cannot see. The spaces in the nets are made just big enough to fit the heads of the targeted fish so that when they swim into the net and try to back out, they become entangled by their gills. They're used to catch fish like herring, flatfish, and small pelagic fish, which are the fish living in upper layers of the open sea. So here are some images of what it looks like. Uh, one diagram that shows the fish coming in and then they're going through their gills getting caught and then the fish getting further tangled because they can't get out because the net is caught between their gills and their fins. So then you can see it here in real life where the fish are being pulled up out of the water um, as they're caught or being pulled up in the boat and here you can see the fish are all tangled up in these nets. So purseining is the fishing method of encircling a school of fish with a large wall of net. It makes me think of Dory in Finding Nemo series of fish. There's a scene. The net is drawn together underneath the fish like a drawstring purse so that they cannot escape. The net is then pulled aboard the boat. And today's seeing boats are very powerful, being equipped with large nets and hydraulic hydraulic winches. So instead of people having to pull them on, there's systems, um, machines that do it. They're used to catch tuna, mackerel, and herring. So here is an example. You can see in this diagram, this big, huge net is going around the, the sea of fish. And here from an upper view, you can see, so the net goes around, the boat is driving around. isn't following it and coming around, they come back to the, then they pull and there are all the fish caught inside the net. So here's one, you can see all of these little fish caught in this net. And here's a different angle. You can see how this big, huge crane um, and winch is gonna be able to pull this huge net um, with thousands of fish up on and then dump it onto the boat. So those are the two methods that are common for commercial fishing, but there's the problem of bycatch mortality. So this is one of the concerns. So while commercial fishing brings in valuable catches, they are not always the most sustainable way of extracting the resource of fish. One of the major problems of many commercial fishing methods is bycatch mortality. So bycatch are the non-targeted fish, marine mammals, turtles, and marine diving birds that are caught. So there's all sorts of things that end up getting caught in these nets that we don't want to, that are not being uh, targeted for the fishing. So once they are dragged onto the boat, uh, the and the fishing nets, they're discarded. And so many of them die because they just get thrown out after either they die in the nets, they get caught under the water and they can't get up to breathe. If they're a marine mammal, or they're caught under the water and they can't get up the breathe because they're a bird, um, or they're pulled onto the boat and uh, they've been injured and they just get tossed to the side and end up dying. So right now um, in California, there is an end to drift net gill nets. Um, as you can see there, it just shows you some various animals that get trapped in these and caught in these nets. Um, this is a drawing, obviously, but it just gives you that image of why this is a problem. Um, you can think about tuna and dolphins and whales being caught in tuna nets. And so then there was a big push in the 90s about that being banned. Um, so that's continuing to be an issue.
So one of uh, selective practice, so state of practice is selective fishing to decrease the bycatch mortality. So this targets a particular fish species while avoiding and releasing non-targeted fish species. So selective fish fishing involves modifying conventional fishing methods. So it means that using selective purse nets that are made to allow small fish to escape without being brought on board of the boat. So they don't just get caught and are thrown away. A selective fish netting uses, sorry, gill netting uses a weed line to lower the top edge of the net by one or two meters below the water surface so that the non-targeted fish species can pass overhead unharmed. And dip nets and underwater revival cages are used to retrieve and store bycatch species before they are returned to the water. So there are some options. Uh, next, I was gonna show you a video with, um, that talks about the case of the Atlantic cod, which is a historical um, part of the Canadian and American um, fishing industry on the Atlantic coast, but, when I attempt to record a YouTube video, it gets all garbly and doesn't work. So that is something that I'm working on in terms of my technology issues. I'll just give you a quick summary of how it goes. Maybe it's something that you've hopefully heard of before. Um, cod used to be, there used to be huge, like 40 pound, 50 pound cod. All of the cod were huge um, along the Atlantic coast. So in the Maritimes and in New England, in the States, and they were just everywhere. So you would just fishing, like fishers would just pull in like thousands of pounds of cod a day. Um, it, there were just such a plentiful resource for even like 30 years ago. And we overfished them. So people, that was just so easy that anybody basically could go out and catch cod and um, they would be, have these huge fish. Um, so people just kept doing it and kept doing it. And then our technology advanced. And so we got to be, we figured out ways to fish better and better. And, um, over time, the fish weren't able to live as long because we were catching them. We were catching and therefore they were not growing as big and they were, um, so cod is now smaller than it used to be and significantly declined, um, the numbers of cod. So because we've overfished them, we have, extracted way too much of this resource if we are thinking of fish as a resource and they are having a really hard time to replenish to the same numbers that they were before it's probably impossible for them ever to return to the numbers that they were but they are working towards rehabilitating the environment so that the cod are able to survive and not become endangered or extinct there are various laws in place about the quotas and things that how much you're allowed to fish. And that is one step that is working towards it, but it is sort of a cautionary tale that we're often referred to um, in terms of extracting too much of a resource and how we, something is only renewable if it can replenish faster than we can extract it or that we do extract it. Um, and that's how we can continue to use fish sustainably for generations to come or forestry or other animals if we're giving them a chance to reestablish their populations opposed to us just uh, wiping them out. I will link this video in the notes of our lesson uh, so you can go and look at it if you'd like to. Um, I just didn't want to play it and it'd be all garbly and not uh, not work while you, yeah, anyway. So then there's also, um, as people are trying to figure out different options about how to improve making fishing more sustainable, there are open net cage fish farms. So fish farms are one method that uh, we're attempting to learn from the cause experience and not overfish wild fish. So aquaculture, like aqua farming, water farming, has developed for many reasons. One of these is the growing concern about shrinking fish stocks due to overfishing, like I, we were just talking about cod. So fish farms have been operating in Canada since the 1970s. 
and have provided an alternative to harvesting wild fish stocks. That sounds good. However, some forms of fishing, or farm fishing, sorry, fish farming, there we go, like open net cage fish farming can threaten wild fish stocks. So the, our solution is creating new problems. So with open net cage farming, open cages are used to raise fish like salmon in coastal waters that are then sold internationally. Open net cage fish farms threaten wild fish stocks and marine habitats in many ways. So fish, so these are big nets that are in, so it's just like dividing off an area of the ocean to farm these animals. Um, but of course, water doesn't stay divided between when it's just a net. So fish waste and fish feed, which often contains drugs and pesticides, pollute the surrounding waters because it gets, it just flows through the nets. Uh, sea lice and disease can spread from farm fish to wild stocks. So these fish that are all being grown in these confined areas get different diseases and that can then spread out again because things are interchangeable. And farm fish can escape their nets and threaten native wild fish. Uh, so they become predators in the, in the wild. So many environmental organizations believe that fish farming must move away from using open net cages to close containment systems that prevent escapes and the spread of disease and pollution. So we're not saying that fish farming is not a good idea, but we need to continue to be cautious about it and how it's impacting the environment around it. So now you can do the key questions on page 179, uh, the check part, your understanding questions one and two. Now we are looking at forestry. So silviculture systems is the variety of ways that forests are managed for timber and habitat wildlife conservation and rec recreation. So they cover all the decisions that go into managing forest stand from planting to harvesting to replanting and tending growth. Forest stand is just a collection of the trees that have similar characteristics. There are two major types of silver culture systems, even aged and uneven aged. So as you can get, even aged system are relatively small age differences between the individual trees. So they're all roughly the same age. Uh, and this is clear cut systems and shelter wood systems are systems of logging or managing these forests. Uneven age systems are the trees that have various ages and this is selection systems. So let's look at clear cut systems. So these are used for stands of trees that require full sunlight to thrive. So they're shade intolerant trees. They need lots of space and lots of light. So for example, poplar, white birch, spruce are all trees that are shade intolerant trees. So it's meant to resemble a large natural disaster. Um, so something like a tornado coming in and clearing out a strip of trees, then it gives a chance for a reset or a rebirth of that forest area. So all the trees in a selected area of a stand are removed, whether in blocks, strips, or patches. Forest debris like stumps and branches are left in place to provide nutrients for soil development and habitats for animals and other plants. Areas of uncut forest are also left along rivers, lakes, and areas important for wildlife. Once an area is clear cut, it is left to grow freely for 60 to 120 years until it is mature and ready to be reharvested. Clear cutting results in a new even aged forest so that it continues to be the same sort of cycle. So here are some images, um, quite a range. So these are some, I found some from BC where people are protesting the destruction of the old growth forest. So like this is a huge ginormous tree um, with this person. And then you can see later they this tree had been logged, it had been cut down and the person you can still see is the same size. So just the dramatic difference between these two pictures between before when it was an old growth forest and now when it's been logged. Um, here similarly on this other end of my screen is another, another image where you can see that where the forest has been logged and I'm pretty sure it's the same person. They're still in the same outfit. The red outfit looks like they had a plan, um, but you can see quite the difference. 
So that's sort of like at the, the forest level. So you can see right in it. Here you can see further on top how clear cutting can look um, where the just complete patches of areas or strips have been uh, completely cut, completely cleared. Then you can see down here are some pictures of where the forests are working to come back um, and are slowly repopulating. These trees, you can tell, are nowhere near the size. It's in a different area than these BC pictures, but like these old growth trees are huge. They are like incredibly large and have taken thousands of years to get that size. We can't just repopulate that in a couple hundred years. All right, then we have shelter wood system. So this, the trees in the stand are removed in stages over a short period of time to promote the growth of an even age new stand under the shelter of an old one. This system is aimed for protecting and sheltering new growth after trees have been cut. It also aims to mimic natural disturbances like wind, fire, insects that leave large gaps in a forest canopy. It is used with mild tolerant, mid tolerant trees that grow in partial shade as saplings, but need also need some sunlight to grow. So oak, ash, and hemlock are examples. So here is a picture of the cycle of shelter wood processing. So we have a mature, even age stand of mid tolerant trees. And we have a prep, they do a prep cut where you can see they've cut um, these trees down, these ones that are sort of whitish now. So the first cut was done with trees of 60 to 80 years old but opens up the forest crown by removing these diseased trees or competing species like white birch and poplar. So they try to give space for more trees to thrive. Then we have the seed cut. So this cut is performed when trees are 80 to 100 years old, opens the crown to about 50% of cover and leaves the best seed bearing trees. The seed cut may be combined with prep, but these might happen at the same time. Then the first removal, when a dense carpet of seedlings has become established, about half of the remaining stems are removed. This creates a partial sunlight conditions required for seedlings development. So you can see now there are small trees have grown because they these trees, these big ones have dropped their seeds. They're small and so they need some more space and air. So the sunlight so they can grow more. And then the final removal, the majority of the remaining mature trees are removed to release the, run, the young trees that have become established. So many of these are removed in order to create space for these to continue to grow. And then thinning and tending operations may occur to improve the stand over time. And then it ends up being back a mature, even age stand of mid tolerant trees. So it's a cycle that goes round and round and round. So here are some images of that. Um, so this is a drawing where there's the original uncut stand then 15 years after establishment, and then 40 years after establishment. So you can see that it doesn't, um, it's never clear cut and there's already always space for new trees to be growing. It's kind of hard to see what it looks like from just an image. Uh, the clear cut is pretty dramatic, whereas these ones are not quite as dramatic. So it's sort of hard to get a sense of what's going on. Um, this one image looking at this, this is the area where there's still some, they can do it in patches. Um, so then you can, then these will be get filled in due to the seedlings coming from these areas that are still there. Okay, then we have selection system. So this is mostly used for shade tolerant hardwood forests, which make up much of central Ontario. Shade tolerant hardwoods like beech and sugar maple are able to grow in well shaded understory beneath the forest canopy. This aims to mimic minor natural disturbances like wind, disease, or produces an uneven age stand. So we're going to have older trees and younger trees. So here's a cycle for selection. So again, we have a mature tolerant hardwood forest. So you can see it has various kinds of trees. The first cut, the overmature or poor quality trees, up to 30% of the total are marked and then cut. So things that are getting ready to die um, are cut down first, but only up to 30%. Then after 20 to 30 years, the remaining trees have thrived and the next generation is well established, right? Because trees keep growing. You can see in our little image, these trees have grown bigger. Then the second cut, once again, up to 30% of the mature trees are cut, focusing to remove poor quality trees. 
And then after another 20 to 30 years, the forest is ready for a third cut to remove another 30 percent trees. So the cycle continues. So you take every 20 to 30 years, you take about 30 percent away to give space for the healthy younger trees to grow until they're older. And then you cut those ones down to continue the cycle around and around. So here are some images, again, kind of hard to see um, because it's not a super clear cut. So you can see here, there's some trees that are marked. That's sort of what stands out to my mind, that selection. Um, or here you can see, okay, so things are being cut down um, and then there's new growth and then new growth. Like you can't, you really can't see any dramatic differences because things are growing and being cut together. You can also do it in groups where you can see in this image, you can see where there's uh, older trees, middle-aged trees, and then younger trees, and then where the areas have just been cut. So it doesn't have to be individual trees. You can do it in groups as well. Um, yeah. So there are advantages and disadvantages to all three different methods. So here's just a quick diagram that shows a reminder of the three. So clear cutting, where we cut up a whole big strip, shelter wood logging, where you pick and choose groups, and then select cutting where you're picking more group, choosing more individual. So the economics advantages of clear cutting. So it allows for easier and efficient harvesting operations since all the trees are removed. It's safer for workers because all the trees are removed and harvesting is less expensive because of higher volume hectare removal. So timber can be sold at a competitive price. So economically clear cutting is great. But environmentally, the disadvantages are clear cutting all trees damages entire forest ecosystems, changing it to farm like conditions where trees are replanted in a planned uniform manner. It's not suitable to wildlife that thrive in habitats with overhead cover. It may cause erosion and water runoff into streams and lakes. No ground cover can cause warming and cooling of area changing microclimates. So economically, no, sorry, environmentally, clear cutting is not a good idea. So then shelterwood has some economics disadvantages. So it requires more skill and time to regenerate the forest. It requires more skill and time to cut the trees. So harvesting is more expensive and more expensive harvest means cost is passed on to the timber consumer. So yes, but there are advantages environmentally. It's less destructive to the forest habitats. It protects new growth of forest and seeds from trees are left standing will help regenerate the area and there's less erosion and water runoff. But there's also disadvantages. Specific areas of forest ecosystems are disturbed, changing microclimates that affect wildlife and plant habitats. So there are both advantages and disadvantages environmentally and then some disadvantages economically. So in selection system, economically there are disadvantages. So again, it requires even more skill and time to regenerate the forest and requires even more skill and time to cut the trees. So harvesting again is more expensive. And again, this means that the um, expense is passed on to the timber consumer. But the advantages of are environmentally, there are advantages. So harvesting only mature trees of desired size, type, and quality. There's less disrupted to forest habitats and associated fish spawning, nesting, and wildlife habitats. There's less of soil erosion and runoff, water runoff, and there's less effect on microclimates. So selection system is really best for the environment. Um, clear cut system is best economically. So we have to talk about, see, decide what word we value. So now you can do the key questions on page 182 of the Check Your Understanding questions one and two. All right, so now we're gonna look at industrial minerals. So specifically, we're going to highlight, we're gonna focus on uh, salt. So industrial minerals are non-metallic minerals that are used in construction, manufacturing, and chemical industries. Manufacturers rely on industrial minerals like silica and limestone to produce plastic, glass, and ceramics. Also in construction, shade is used to make bricks. But salt is used to flavor our food, but it's also used to deice our roads and soften water. It has, as a raw material, it's used in chlorine chemical processes that produce everything from soap to digital cameras. Salt has no, sorry, 14,000 known uses. So salt we use in a whole bunch of ways. So that's why we're gonna look at focus on salt because we use it so much. 
So Canada's salt deposits are found in three major rock formations. In Ontario, salt is found along the shores of Lake Huron and Lake Erie. The deposits are part of the saucer-shaped geological structure known as the Michigan Basin that underlines mo much of southwestern Ontario. These salt formations lie at depths of up to 825 meters below the surface, and the salt beds can be over 200 meters thick. There are two major methods used to extract salt in Canada. There's underground room and pillar mining and brining. So first we're gonna look at room and pillar mining. So it's a conventional mining method used usually to extract relatively flat laying blanket deposits like salt. It's used to mine other natural resources such as coal, iron, stone, and potash. So how it works is that it extracts material across a horizontal plane while leaving pillars of untouched materials to support the open areas of the rooms that are mined underground. We're gonna look at a picture so you can see. Rock salt can be mined in this way up to depths of around 600 meters. In a salt mine, a vertical shaft is sunk into the salt to lower workers and machinery used to haul out crushed salt, rock salt. The rooms in a mine can be nine to 15 meters wide, but around 40 to 60% of the salt must be left as pillars to support the roof of the mine so that the ground doesn't crush people. So here are some pictures. So you can see, this is sort of a cross section where we've cut kind of, because really there is gonna be uh, ground here, right? It's undermining, we're just looking. So you can see these pillars are what, they leave these pillars every certain amount so that they can drive through, but then that is still holding up the, the thick, thick soil and earth that is above them. Um, but you can see there's still these huge machines that are sent down there to, to extract the, the salt. Here you can see the live picture of it, what it really looks like in terms of these huge rooms and these huge pillars of salt. All of this is salt, wild, huh? Okay, so then brining is when water is injected into salt deposits lying at depths of up to a thousand meters. So this can go deeper. The resulting brine or salt saturated solution, right? If you think about brine like in terms of food, it's the same idea, is pumped to the surface, then transported by pipeline to evaporating plants that use steam heat to dry out the brine to make salt. It can also be taken to chemical processing plants where the brine solution is used to manufacture chlorine, caustic soda, and other industrial chemicals. Only about one quarter of Canada's salt is brine, and most of this is used in chemical manufacturing. So here you go, you can see the system. So you can see here we're pumping in water and then that dissolves the salt and then we pump out the brine further. Um, so then it gets processed and evaporated. There's very different ways, um, kind of hard stuff to see. And then you can see the resulting rock salt. Um, which then we use and process in various ways. So that is our lesson 22. So we are done our second last unit. So this is the methods for extracting Canada's natural resources. We talked, a reminder that we talked about commercial fishing. Remember we talked about gill netting and purse seining as ways that we currently fish commercially um, and then fish farms is another way that attempting to be more sustainable, but there are still definitely issues. So there are advantages um, basically up economically for all of these things, all of these methods of fishing, because the goal of commercial fishing is to make money, but there are definitely environmental impacts and disadvantages of all of these different methods and are continuing, they are continuing to attempt to make changes, but that still needs to be done more. Then we talked about forestry, we talked about the silver culture systems, so the various different ways that we log. So remember we talked about clear cutting, shelter wood, and selection, how they're all different and they all have their own advantages and disadvantages. Again, clear cutting being having the most economical advantages and environmental disadvantages, and selection having the most economical disadvantages and environmental advantages. 
And we talked about industrial mining minerals, um, specifically salt. And we just mentioned room and pillar mining and brining as the two ways that we extract uh, the resource salt from the environment. So hopefully now you can explain the various methods of commercial fishing as well as their consequences. And then the various methods of logging and forestry as well as their consequences. And finally, you can explain the different methods of mining salt and their consequences. So then we can do the questions, review questions on page 185, questions one through 14. Mm -hmm. And that is all that we have for today. So, um, if you have any questions, please reach out. Remember your work is due by June 10th. It must be done, done by June 10th. So please get it in by June 10th. Um, you can call me if you wanna talk, we need processing or you need support with anything, call me at 807-737-1488, extension 2209. Uh, you can also call toll free at 1-800-667-3703. I do have access to my voicemail these days. So feel free to leave me a message and I will get back to you as soon as I can. You can email me at bronwyn.slate, which is B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot C-A. You can Facebook me at B Slate Wassa. You're welcome to friendly, friend me or just Facebook message me. Um, that's totally fine. All of our lessons are up on YouTube under a playlist called SVN3E. Uh, the YouTube channel is called B Slate Wassa. So hopefully that is fairly straightforward to find. There also are supplementary videos, all of our videos that we've watched in class. Um, in case the sound doesn't work and it's all garbled, it is there on, I've listed them as there as well so that you can find them either through the show notes of the individual lessons or just under the supplementary video list where you can see all of them that we've watched. My office hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So if you'd like to get a hold of me, that is the best time. Though remember, I do teach the first hour and the last hour of the day. So I'm unavailable at those times, but I'll come back to you as soon as I can. I'm fairly good at getting back uh, quickly, though now that I've said that, probably life's going to happen and it'll be impossible. Anyway, take care. I hope you're doing well and we are almost finished. Thanks so much for joining me. Bewitch.